But tonight I want to talk to you about six facts to thinking flourishingly. Now that's interesting. I really worked on that word flourishingly because it's the word I'm really looking for. How do I begin to think in a way that actually multiplies my life? How do I really come to a place to where I think about things that are greater than me and becoming greater than myself? How do I really come to that spot? Now, whether you realize this or not, each and every one of us have risen to the place that our families have taught us. All of us are there right now. We don't need to wonder about it. And, and actually, what the reason why that we reject a lot of the things that we're taught is because we didn't learn it at home. But the things that we did learn at home, those things you just readily accept. But when you finally come to Christ, when you finally come to Jesus, you have to understand something. That the gospel has two sides. It has the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus, right? So the person of Jesus, he prepares you for eternity. You get ready for eternity by accepting Christ. That's what happens to you when you accept Jesus. You are ready to be able to proverbially meet your maker the moment that you come into a relationship with the Lord. Now, interestingly enough, I'm, I am of the... I am of the persuasion, and we'll just call it a personal persuasion, because most of us in this room, we live a cultural Christianity. We don't necessarily live a biblical Christianity. We live a cultural Christianity. And this cultural Christianity is we, we continue more and more every day reducing the commitment that it takes in order to be a person of faith. We reduce that every day. It's less and less. Well, you don't have to do that, and you don't have to do this, and you don't have to do that, and you don't have to do this. Well, we don't need to do that. You know, the Bible never says you have to do that. And so people go through all these things that they don't have to do consi and consistently beginning to narrow down what is a requirement in order to fit into an eternity with God. Now, you'll never know whether that's true or not. And of course, the reason why that there are over 1,000 denominations is because different strokes for different folks. So one individual believes that if you, you know, if you don't get baptized, you're not a Christian. Another person says, well, it only really, it just demands faith. Another guy you run into says, well, if you don't dunk, you're sunk. You know, I mean, it's just a whole bunch of different things, and people have these different flavors that they embrace. Well, you know what? I like Pentecostal churches. Another guy says, well, I like Baptist churches. I like a little bit more framework with what I'm doing. So because of that, I want to make sure that I've got these, these markers that I can say that I've achieved certain things. So the person of Jesus actually prepares you for eternity, but the principles of Jesus actually, whether you realize this or not, the principles of Jesus prepare you to be able to finance the gospel in the earth. Well, now, what was Jesus said? And what did Jesus say? He said, Now, he said, Go into all the world and do what? Make what? Disciples. Make what? Disciples. Disciples. Say, Disciple. So now, how in the world can you make a disciple when you continually reduce the things that are necessary in order for a person to be one? Doesn't make sense, does it? Okay. But remember that when you're here, you're supposed to go into how much of the world? Well, how can you do that if, in fact, you can't afford a plane ticket? You can have a wish. I wish I would. You know what? If I had the money, this is exactly what I would do. This is exactly what I would do. Now, somebody would say, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, I mentioned this morning the, the person who Jesus would back as president of the, of the United States. Remember when I mentioned that? Who would Jesus vote for? Okay. Now, everybody's going. <laughs> and they're kind of going things like, is this for black people or for white people? What is this? Or is this for yellow people? Well, that's because if we had a bunch of Chinese people, that would be what it would be all about. 
But no, it's not really either one of them. But in the book of Luke, chapter 12, Jesus actually said, he said these words. When someone came to him and said, Jesus, my brother won't give me anything. Tell him, tell him to split my father's inheritance with me. And Jesus didn't say, well, that's right. What you need to do is you need to be sharing with your brother. Jesus never said that. Jesus said, man, who made me judge over you? Why am I, why are you coming to me asking me about distributing the wealth that belongs to your brother, making sure that you get it? So that needs to tell you everything you need to know about who Jesus would vote for. Jesus was never Robin Hood. Jesus never took from one to give to another. It steals from you your choice of generosity. And you must prove consistently to eternity that you are generous. Not that someone took something from you. Well, here's what we want to do. We want to tax people a whole bunch. Well, wait a second. If you tax a person, they don't have the, they don't have the choice of being able to give to others. Because people take from you because they don't believe that you would. But as far as God's concerned, that's what separates us. That's what proves whether or not that you and I belong to God. Our generosity proves hugely exactly who we are. So there are two different sides. There is the person of Jesus that prepares me for eternity. But the principles of Jesus actually prepare me for preaching the gospel around the world. And that's kind of really important. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse number 7, the Bible tells us this wisdom. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. He said, therefore, get wisdom. He said, and with all of your getting, get understanding. Now, why would, why would Solomon say those words? Interestingly enough, it's true that a man cannot rise above the level of his own understandings. I can't rise above the things that I understand. I'll never be any better than the things I understand. If I don't understand something and I don't get it, then, I, then truthfully, that's what keeps me in the place where I am. Why? Because ignorance is man's greatest enemy. Ignorance is you don't know. It's that I don't know something. And when I don't know something, it actually causes me to be disqualified from being able to experience it. In the book of Hosea chapter 4, we know this as far as the Bible is concerned. He said that my people are destroyed for a lack of what? Because they didn't know. They just didn't know. Now, it's interesting that he said that if you have rejected, and I, and I don't want this part of the verse in there, because I only want to give you the first part, but let me finish this since you're reading it. He said, because you have rejected knowledge, he said, I'll also reject you. Now, that's pretty interesting. Why in the world would God say that? Well, here's a very interesting thing. God, God's greatest pleasure, as you know, God's greatest pleasure is to be believed. When you don't believe God, that is the thing, that whole issue of me speaking about trust this morning. That's a big thing to God. If I don't trust him. If I don't trust God, it has nothing to do with God. It's got everything to do with what another human did to me. And so but he said here, he said, because you have rejected my knowledge, he said, I will also reject you. And you'll be no priest to me since you have forgotten God's word. He said, also, I'll forget your children. You think, oh my goodness, how could God forget our kids? It wasn't really him that forgot them. It was that what happened was, was that the kids have no father at home. The kids have a mother that's as much of a crackhead as the other kids in the neighborhood are. They find their mother doing stuff that a mother is never supposed to do. It wasn't God that forgot our kids. It was us. 
but didn't remember to teach them what he said. And so because of that, he, here he said, because this happened, he said, I'll also forget your children. Because a doctor, friends, remember that a doctor can know a lot about health and know just a little bit about money. I have a fellow, I have a chiropractor because I, I go to the chiropractor. And somebody said, do you go to a chiropractor? Yes, I do. Let me just, let me mention something to you right here. Because it, I think it really is important to put it right here. Let's talk about elective surgery for just a moment. Elective surgery. Do you understand what elective surgery is? It's when you're ugly and you do whatever you can do to make yourself pretty. That's what elective surgery is. That, that's, that's, that, that's elective. I'm ugly and I don't want to be, and so I'm going to do whatever I can do in order to fix this. That's, it's kind of like the, the Jewish girls when they, when they get nose jobs. That's the thing that they do when they're 16. They get, I'll get nose jobs. And so what happens is, is that the guy never knows what, what his wife's nose looks like until they have a child. And they think... And he turns around and he says, you had a nose job. Well, she said, oh, yeah, two. <laughs> Man, what are we going to do for our kids? Well, she, when she gets to be 16, she'll go get her a nose job. Then, we, you know, we'll try to push her off on somebody else who doesn't know the nose. He just doesn't know the nose. And so elective surgery is interesting because elective surgery is exactly that. Somebody said, well, you know, you're having elective surgery. Why don't you just believe God? Well, elective surgery has nothing to do with believing God. Remember, you and I live in this physical body. This physical body is not you. It's just not you. And because it's not who you are, it's not you as an individual, when you need to get something fixed, get it fixed. The same way when you were so vain and you were so Greek, you decided that you were going to get your, you know, your face fixed. Sometimes you just need to get other parts of your body fixed just as well. If there's something wrong with your stomach, you get your stomach fixed. Some said, don't you think I should believe God? Yeah, but you shouldn't die in the meantime. Remember, your biggest, a lot of times what happens is people want to actually build their house in a storm. They want, to be, they want to build their life of faith in the middle of actually the worst thing that a human body can ever go through. And you don't do that. What you do is fix it and get back on the word. But you still believe God regardless of whether or not that you went in to get some of the, to get, you know, everything working the way it needs to work. You still believe God. But don't think that a person has any less faith than somebody else because they went to the doctor. You went to, you had to go to the doctor when you were born. You just, you just don't even remember that you were there when it happened. But you were there. And so don't get all hung up on this doctor thing. Get hung up on the fact that you need to believe God. But don't get hung up on the doctor. Don't let anybody kind of say to you, we know if you had faith. Well, no, wait a second. You know, Paul had Luke travel with him. Why? Because Luke was a doctor. So, well, I didn't know that. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I didn't know that. The truth of it is, is that there will be moments when you know you need to believe God. And there are moments when you'll know that you need to go to the doctor. And don't let those two places mix with each other. And don't sit there and judge yourself over, you know, if I had faith or if the Bible was really true, uh, then it would have happened for me. As though we are the standard by which God lives his life. And so don't, don't get yourself off on that stuff. And so elective surgery is exactly that. You are electing to do so. Why? Because I like longevity. Somebody said, well, you know, they lived 200 years. You know, they lived 300 years. Moses, how, well, no, Moses was 120. How old was Noah? 
Noah he wasn't. That I don't How old was Noah? Hey doll, how old was Noah? I think he was 600. I think he was around 600. But you have to understand that before the fall, and you'll notice this, before the fall and after the fall, the length of people's lives. Before the fall, they lived much longer. They didn't, they didn't have to deal with as many um, different types of rays that are hitting their bodies. As time goes on, you'll find, and now really after the fall, it almost came into the very same the very same lifespan as we have right now. It's not much different. The average lifespan today, the average lifespan of an American individual, which is much greater than anybody else on the face of the earth, is 77.9. That's the average lifespan. That takes in, according to all the people who died when they were 20 because they were jerky, and then, you know, the people that lived to be 105. It's 77.9. And so, how old was Noah? How old? Nine, 50. Shoot, he must have been really ugly. I mean, just, just think about it. I mean, 950 years. That's the reason why they wore those kind of clothes. You just put a sheet over whatever you want. It's kind of like. But a doctor can know a lot about health and just know a little about me. Do you understand about elective surgery? It's an election. You elect to do it. I want to encourage you to do it. I want to encourage you to do. Some of y'all need a little. I want to encourage you a little more than others. <laughs> but, but for the most part, I want to encourage whatever elective surgery you need to have. Get it. But you'll know inside whether or not that what you're supposed to do. You say, no, you know, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is, I, is I'm actually believing God this is going to fix itself. Well, but I thought it was going to, and it really didn't go to the doctor. The reason why that God gave us that technology was so that you and I could actually have a long life to be able to serve him. Not for us to be able to make ourselves or our kids or the situations of life an experiment of what we call faith, that we're uncertain about what it really means. Do you understand that? So elective surgery is kind of... um, is, is an important thing. But a doctor can know a lot about health and know just a little bit about money. I told you that I went to the chiropractor, and, and he's, this chiropractor, he's a great guy. I love him. I love him. His name is John. John's a great, great guy. I really like talking to John. He's really wonderful. But John had a practice of his own at one time, but he failed at it. He failed at it. As a matter of fact, he ended up, he ended up going a little bit batty over the fact that he didn't make it in business. Well, you know, a doctor can know a lot about health and just know a little bit about business. And you have to realize that. A person can actually know a lot about prayer, but know a little bit about God's finances. People, what people don't understand is actually the Bible has 2,000, over 2,350 scriptures on finances. Do you understand that that is twice as much as prayer and faith combined? That 11 out of the 39, 11 out of the 39 parables that are in the Bible actually are directly about money. It is the number, Jesus spoke about money 15% of the time. Why is it? Because he is not interested in two things. A, his children living underneath the curse that Adam put on this earth. Because what did God say to Adam? The ground is what? Because of you. That's number one. And number two is that God wants to tell you, hurry up and get up. Just get up. Just do something. I remember when I played baseball when I, when I was younger, and I actually made this impossible play. It was absolutely impossible for somebody to do it. And not only, not only was it impossible, but I knew it was impossible and no one was more surprised about it than I was. I actually caught this, this particular ball, fully extended, and I got, my, I got my mitt on it. And I was so mesmerized at the fact that I caught the ball 
I didn't get up and throw the guy out. <laughs> because I could make the play, I just couldn't finish it. I just couldn't finish it. And so, remember, Jesus spoke about finances 15% of the time. He wants you to be successful because there's one thing for us, and, this, and you have to know this. You have to get a hold of this. And there's an entire industry that's out there that actually depicts what I'm about to say. <clears throat> get to the point in your life where you're attempting to go beyond just getting rid of the things that you object to. Well, I'm having trouble, man. I, I had trouble growing up. Okay, I got that fixed. I got, I got trouble in my marriage. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you, and you got trouble. I got trouble in my marriage. Well, okay, and Jesus fixed it for me. I got trouble in this part of my life, and Jesus fixed it for me. I got trouble in this part of my life, and Jesus fixed it for me. And by the time that Jesus gets those three or four things fixed in your life, most people stop. They don't realize that it's not about getting things fixed. It's about you fixing this broken world. So you go beyond the fact of just having something fixed in your life. But you come to the place to where you're now adding to what Jesus did. Instead of just consuming what Jesus did. Do you understand that? You begin to add to it. You begin to multiply it. You begin to embrace it. You begin to talk about it. You begin to talk about winning. You begin to talk about success being a success. You begin to talk about picking yourself up off the ground. And I mentioned that thing about making that play. When I hit the ground, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't. Get, I couldn't believe that I got so far that I couldn't get up. And that's what happens to Christians. Is they get so far, but they just don't get up. They're so excited over the fact that they got one thing fixed in their life that they don't ever get any better. They're just still there. They just still remain there. And the time just ticks away. And they just ticks, it ticks, it ticks, it ticks, it ticks away. And they refuse to believe the reason why that God has them here. See, a woman can know a lot about being a mother and know very little about being a woman. Girls, you can know a lot about being a mother, know nothing about being a woman. How tragic. A man can know a lot about hunting and know nothing about being a father. And as I mentioned, a believer can know a lot about prayer, but nothing about prosperity. In the book of 3 John, verse number 2, we find that there's something that, that prosperity of mind, of body, all of this is all mental. Every bit of prosperity <clears throat> in life is mental. Look at what it says here in 3 John 2 in the Message Bible. He said, we're the best of friends. And I pray for good fortune in everything that you do. He said, and for your good health, that your everyday affairs prosper as well as your soul. Because prosperity has more to do with your mind than with your money. Every person that you ever come in contact with, they have a charge when you come in contact with them. They either have a positive charge or a negative charge when you come in contact with any person that you come in contact with. You know whether this person is a plus or a minus when you meet them. You know whether or not that that individual's life is ascending or that person's life is descending. Every per and you know it. It's not like you don't know that to be true. You know it. You may not be able to either decipher it or to be able to identify it, but you know that something is there. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that, do you believe that everything that your hands are put to, do you believe that that is to prosper? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, now if you really believe that, if you really believe that, 
then do you believe that prosperity in all areas of life, do you believe that prosperity belongs to God's children? Now, what you need to know is this, is that financial prosperity is on the lowest rung of God's ladder. There is mental prosperity. There is spiritual prosperity. The worst thing that you can ever do is believe that financial prosperity is really the goal for you. If that's your goal, you're missing the entire boat. It has very little to do with it. All I can tell you is this. The more that your mind prospers, the more God equips you to step into those roles that are necessary to be stepped into when you get there. And it takes a certain level of finances in order for you to be able to uh, operate at that place. When you are ready for that place, the finances will all be there. You don't need to be concerned about it. It will always be there. Say, so, well, now, I don't, what do you mean like it will always be? It just will. God will always find a way to be able to get that to you. And that's really important for you to understand. Here's what abundance is so that you understand once again. Abundance is having more than enough to meet our own needs and something left over to care for the needs of others. You see, people hold on to or they hold many beliefs about life intrinsically. Do you understand the term intrinsic? The, there are things that people believe that are just down on the inside of us. If we grew up inside of a, of a home, the reason why that I am very, very sensitive to poverty and to actual um, ill use of time and, and funds and all of those things, the reason why that I am very adverse to all of that was because of how I grew up. I'm adverse to that. We intrinsically have certain beliefs. Every one of us in this room, you have certain inborn things that you think before any knowledge is ever given to you. That's why the whole idea about life in renewing your mind, the whole idea about life is for you to actually delete everything that is inside your hard drive and to clean it before you ever begin to put more back into it. But you have to do that first. You need to delete all of the belief system that you came to Christianity with. Now, what was really positive for me was the fact is that I didn't, I didn't really have very much to get rid of. There wasn't anything in my life that I wasn't willing to get, give away. So that's the reason why that I fight for what God has to say, no matter what situation that it is. I'm only interested in what, what did God say about that? I'm not interested in where, you know, who your mom was or, or what side of the city that you grew up on. I'm not interested. All I'm interested in is what did God say about it? Because the way that you figure it, let me help you with this. The way you figure it isn't going to matter anyway. Because you're going to get so old and you're going to check out of this life and you're going to be gone. And unless you figure out that what God said was the truth, your life will amount to nothing. Now that's what we need to, to actually work on. But understand this, and this is very, very true. If we believe that we're supposed to be poor or that poverty is our destiny, life will actually manifest that for us. It's a funny thing. We don't understand the way that this system that we have inside of us really works. But it works according to the way that we believe. Our life will begin to produce what we think that it's supposed to produce. Well, this person doesn't really, this person isn't really making, that's because that's exactly what they've embraced all of their lives. And because they've embraced it, it just isn't going to work for them. But what if we believe, and, I, and I've met people like this, what if we believe that we're supposed to be blessed? What if we believe that we're supposed to be a blessing to others? 
And our goal in life is to be able to bless every situation that we come to. Wait a second. It's 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now, here's God's Word as the foundation. So that, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly ready to do every good thing. God's Word produces inside of us a life that causes us to produce what God wants us to produce. Otherwise, there would be no need for the Bible. Oh, by the way, Christianity is giving it up. So that's the reason for it. But God wants us to have finances for a number of different things. We've got a responsibility to provide for our own. How in the world am I going to be able to provide for my own? There are people in this room right now that you have parents that you don't take care of. You do. And you think, well, I really can't. Well, that's because, honestly, God wants you to have enough money to care for your parents. Because 1 Timothy 5.8 says what? It says, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith. Wait a second. You may, I'm not going to have God say to me that I've denied the faith and I'm worse than an infidel. Well, you know, you know my brother, he's got money, so he, he can do it. Huh. Now, wait a second. God wants you to do it. He wants you to handle it. Well, yeah, but I don't believe that everyone should be prosperous. I'm not even talking about everybody being prosperous. I'm talking about you taking care of your parents. The second thing God wants us to provide or give us money for is this. Number two is that he wants us to fund the gospel around the world. He wants me to have money to send people around the world. Well, if I'm supposed to be able to help fund the gospel around the world, the Bible says, and how can they actually go unless they be sent? I mean, I got to send them. He didn't say it to you. You see, a lot of times this is what happens to his friends, and don't, I'm not wrong about this, so you don't have to question it, that we expect somebody else to do what God wants us to do, instead of us searching for a way for us to be able to do what God's Word says. I don't want to look at somebody else. I didn't say, here are my Lord, send them. <laughs> no, wait a second. No, here are my Lord, send me. Or here are they, Lord, send them. No, he told me to, to send people around the world with the gospel. The next thing was this. He said, you have to have enough money to pay your taxes, not figure out a way to get out of it. Got to have enough money to pay your taxes. Jesus said, render to Caesar who is Caesar's, Matthew chapter 21 tells us. He said, you know, or 22, he said, you know, but give to God what belongs to God. Now, wait a minute. You mean to, mean to tell me I have to pay my taxes and give to God? Man, God must want, want me to have a lot of money. But see, mo many individuals don't believe that they should. They think somebody else should do it. Or they feel bad because someone talks to them about it. Never feel bad because someone says something to you. Only feel bad if they say the wrong thing. But don't get mad at anybody because they said the right thing. And then, out of that, the next thing is this. We have to have enough to support the less fortunate. Hmm. Support the less fortunate? What do you mean? No one can take it from you. You have to give it. You give it. Because God called you to support the weak. 
Not for me to say, I gave it the office. No, he wants me to support the weak. You see, it's impossible, friends, for the child or for a child of the highest to really be poor. Put up James chapter 2, verse number 5. This here is an interesting verse. In James chapter 2, it tells us something that, that really, someone said, it's impossible for a child of God to be poor. Notice what he said. I wish I would have said this, but I didn't, because then you could blame me if I said it, but I didn't say it. So notice what he said. He said, hearken. That means, look at this. He said, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to them that love him? Say, so, wow. You mean to tell me that there's always people that are kind of coming up God's scale? Yep. Jesus said the poor you'll have with you how often? That's exactly right, but they're not the same poor. They're not the third generation, fourth generation, or fifth generation of welfare. Everybody goes through moments in their life where they need help. But that doesn't mean you need, to be, need help forever. Once you begin to understand this, it changes kind of like a few of the ways that you feel. So I'm going to stop here. This isn't the end, but this is just where I'm stopping. So just roll those, those thoughts really quickly. Number one. Honest, number one. Help me, number one. No, 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 no. The, 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 the facts. Number one about the facts. The facts about prosperous thinking. Number one, the facts. The future that every man wants or does not is created by a thought that he should have or should not. The future that you want or you don't want is created by a thought that you should have or shouldn't have. Number two. Number two, any thought left unchallenged is established as fact. I couldn't even change that one myself. Any thought, that's the... This is, the, this is what happens with people that you know. This is what happens in politics. This is what happens in life. If you don't challenge a thought that somebody else has, it will be established as a fact. They begin to think that this is a fact when it had absolutely nothing to do with fact at all. Number three, if you never change your thoughts, it will be impossible for you to change your destinations. Life is a series of destinations. And if you don't change your thoughts, the destinations will continue to happen. And the number of destinations put together is called a destiny. Number four, you'll always move in the direction of your most repetitive thoughts. The thought that you keep thinking and you keep thinking and you keep thinking and you keep thinking and you, thinking and you don't change it, but you keep thinking it and thinking it and thinking it and thinking it and thinking it. What happens is, is that you can't help but move in that direction. You have to stop that thought. That's the only thing that will stop your feet is when you stop the thought. How dare you do that? It's because you continue to think it. Because a man does not do what he believes. A man does the continual thoughts that he has in his mind. You continue to have that thought. You continue to have that thought. You continue to have that thought. And all of a sudden, you begin to move in that direction. You're absolutely tormented over the fact that you're moving in the direction of something that you don't want to do. But you're moving in that direction because you keep having those thoughts. Number four. Number five. Number five. The molding of a man's life is undeniably linked to what a man thinks. My life is molded by what I think. All men's lives are molded by what they think. Number six. As the fruit of your life or fruit in your life today is a result of the thoughts that you allowed yesterday. Any thoughts that I allowed yesterday become the fruit in my life today. I just continue to let those things happen. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Say this after me. Father, in the name of Jesus. By the power of God, I am asking you that I will be everything that you've called me to be. I submit myself 
to the Word of God in every place and in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.